I'm very proud now to present a lecture by Peter Pomerantsev, one of the leading uh, academics and journalists on Russia. Peter has worked for nine years uh, in the 2000s in, in Russia for the TV station TNT and um, published widely for uh, The Atlantic, for the London Review of Books um, on Russia, also um, a strategic paper called uh, Winning the Information War. Um, focusing on Russia, on which also uh, our catalog draws, actually. Peter Pomerantsev drew attention to postmodern philosophy being very popular uh, among Duma members, for example, uh, during the 2000s. And Peter also called uh, Russia a postmodern dictatorship. So I'm very excited to hear Peter, who now is constantly between uh, Kiev, uh, London, Washington, and follows the ongoings uh, in Ukraine. Um, expand on this. Hi, thank you very much. And I'm sorry I can't be with you myself today. So, um, as as uh, as as Kolya said, I mean, I I um I worked in Russia in TV between 2000 and 2010. Uh, making entertainment shows, sort of reality shows. I was I was very far away from politics and the news. Um, I'd gone just gone to film school beforehand, and and um, was really saw my future in, in very far away from politics, making entertainment. And then I sort of, as I lived in Russia, I began to realize I was living in a regime which I went on to call a postmodern dictatorship that was really being um, informed to a huge amount. By, by the rules of, of reality shows. And that was being done in a very conscious way by um, Putin's main propagandist, um, a guy called Vladislav Sokov, who was one of the heroes of, of my first book, um, which was called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which is a sort of play on something that Hannah Arendt once said about Nazi Germany. And um, I would, uh, you know, Today, I think that the, the topic of my of my talk is what is the essence of this postmodern authoritarian propaganda, um, and I want to tell you about my search for a response. So I'm just finishing a book, uh, which is an attempt to tell the story of a counter propagandist uh, who I think might give us really interesting ideas about how to respond to this um, propaganda of, of triumphant sort of cynicism that I saw in Russia and has since then spread across the world. We see elements of it in, in, in Trump, in Orban, in Bolsonaro. But let's just very, just to make sure that we understand what we're, what we're talking about. Um, I think Collier actually summed it up beautifully in his essay which I all encourage you to read on this topic. Uh, but I'll, I'll sum it up again. So what was the essence of, of Surkov, Surkov's big idea and, and the idea which, which has sort of gone on to develop much more sort of, um, I think, directly fascist forms, but still sits at the bottom of, of Russian propaganda and is so popular. Um, he took the ideas of postmodernism and and very consciously perverted them for his aims. Um, you could argue that some of them were implicit in those ideas, but but that's really not my business. I'm I'm not a serious philosopher, nor do I claim to be. I've, I've become a a student of of propaganda um, and and someone who thinks about what to do about it. But what Surkov did, he basically said um, he took the sort of the sort of bad relativism, as John Rawls called it, that was implicit in maybe some vulgar versions of, of postmodernism. The idea that, um, you know, there is no truth or truth is only a subset of, of power. Um, the idea that everything around us are simulacra. Um, and he kind of weaponized this for his own, his own uses. Um, so what do we mean by that? Um, he sort of spread an atmosphere of, of deeply intense cynicism throughout society. Um, his propaganda didn't claim that, you know, 
Russia was the carrier of some great rational historical ideology. Um, he basically said that everybody everywhere lies, that truth is unknowable. He spread the sense of doubt um, to an extent where it tipped into passivity um, and where it tipped into a, a sense that uh, there was nothing you could do or ever change because you could never know the truth. If truth is unknowable, if all ideologies are just word games or language games and forms of manipulation, there really is nothing to fight for, let alone something as democracy or freedom. Um, he sort of was always trying to show that all institutions, both in the West and in Russia, are um, are, are some lack. So whether it's parliaments or political parties or courts of law or elections, his claim was always that in the West, they're a sham. They're all controlled by a deep state. And they are as well in Russia, but that's just what life is like, you know. Um, elections were openly rigged, but as a way of saying, look, how easy it is to rig elections. They are just a joke. They're just a joke here, and they're just a joke there. Everything that you fought for is worthless. Um, um, he did many other things. He sort of, uh, sort of indulged in this idea that um, look, Russia had uh, many parties. He created the parties himself. He controlled the parties himself. But then he told the whole country how he created and controlled them so that people would have the sense that we have different parties who debate each other in TV shows, in parliament, but everybody knows that they're controlled by the Kremlin. And again, his point was, look, democracy is just a piece of reality show theater. It's fun, but it's ultimately meaningless. And it's the same here and over there in the West as well. The democracy that you fought for at the end of the Soviet Union is just a piece of theater. And he played into the sort of deep, deep cynicism that was already very present in Russian society. He sort of um, had a deeply theatrical nature and, and sort of uh, basically almost promoted uh, an idea that uh, all social roles and political roles are sort of masks that you wear in, in a masquerade. You know, you could be a communist in the morning and a fascist in the evening and a Democrat on Sunday. And this is all a game that, that we play in a world where there are no values anymore and there is nothing to fight for. There's no truth, no ideologies. And really, he wins who is most cynical. Um, now, at the base, you want to understand the purpose of this, this, this ideology or pseudo-ideology, anti-ideology that he spread. The purpose was to make people passive. The purpose was to make people give up. And at the end of the day, as we see now, and was already starting to be apparent when I left Russia in 2010, the ultimate aim was a sort of postmodern fascism, where at the end of the day, you have no agency. You can only take power by being part of the collective. You can only express your agency through a strong leader. And so it was a postmodern return to you know, a, a version of the 1930s. Um, all done with an ironic smile and without any grand serious claims of too serious an ideology, but essentially conspiratorial thinking replaced ideology. So instead of a serious communist um, ideology based around Marxist-Leninism, um, you basically had a conspiratorial worldview, which was really the end point of not trusting anything. If you don't trust anything, you don't emerge into freedom. You emerge into a world which is controlled by things you just can never, not quite see. Media study after media study has shown that people who don't trust media don't become free. They just become conspiratorial cynics. Um, and he pushed that way. So conspiracy replaced ideology. A conspiratorial worldview replaced ideology. Um, I'll give you the classic example. When there was a protest movement in 2012 in Russia, the Kremlin spread the story that not only were the protesters, not only were the protesters sort of arms of the CIA, that sort of classic, but actually that the protesters were all arms of the Kremlin. 
And this was a piece of theatre designed by the Kremlin to weed out potential enemies and then arrest them. So everything conspiracy, even the person who you think is the opposition to the Kremlin, Navalny, is part of us, part of the conspiracy. There is nothing you should ever do. Be passive and obey the leader. And instead of, okay, here in ideology, there was just raw emotional identity. I mean, the Kremlin youth movement, which they openly modeled on the Hitler Jugend, uh, was called Nashi, us. I mean, it was sort of politics that was basically reduced to its elemental uh, pieces of us versus them. And a kind of, with it, of course, the legitimization of sadism, which he developed very, very strongly on television, putting forward sort of a, a whole band of propagandists who, who spouted maybe nonsense, but who legitimized a, um, a loathing and since then sort of genocidal rhetoric, normalizing it. So, you know, by stripping away the value of truth, by stripping away any hope for a future, by stripping away values through a sort of perversion of postmodernist philosophy that says nothing is true and everything is possible, he made it, in a way, opened up the return to a version of totalitarian propaganda. Um, he's sort of been pushed aside the last few years, but this is the world he helped create. And you know, we see versions of this everywhere in the world. A Donald Trump speech will start with undermining the idea of truth or laughing at the idea of truth or subverting uh, the possibility of truth and ends with, you know, words that are almost sort of a, a comic book version of, of Freud and Le Bon's ideas of identification with the leader. It's like, you know, I am your revenge against the elites. And when they attack me, they attack you. Classic Trump phrases, which we were saying just yesterday. Um, so that's kind of the world that Surkov created. Um, you know, the Russians tend to be ahead of the trend on a lot of propaganda moments. They were in the 1920s. They are again now. We see versions of this mushrooming throughout the world. But I think it's, it's you know, the aim, I think, really apparent now, has been to, or the end, the effects, has been to return all the things that we thought were taboo through a kind of backdoor of postmodernism. Um, or as my, or as the Yale professor, um, Tim Snyder, once wittily put, post-truth is just pre-fascism. So I've been spending the last, um, really since I wrote the book in 2015, 16, I wrote in 1314, came out in 1516. So the last sort of eight years, thinking about what do we do about this? And after having worked in entertainment, I realized that I actually wanted to do something more serious. And I now work at universities. I was first at the London School of Economics, now at Johns Hopkins University, where I play with ways through various research projects and collaboration with various media and NGOs, trying to work out what to do about it. And pretty quickly, we realize that if you want to reach the audiences who have come under the sway of this sort of propaganda, whether in dictatorship or whether in um, democracies, a lot of things that we thought romantically would work, won't work. So most obviously fact-checking. That was the first big movement. Hold on, let's, if we communicate the truth quickly, and effectively to these audiences, then we can we can you know we can return a sense of reality to the discourse and you know save um, you know the Habermasian public sphere. Um, pretty soon we all realised that this didn't really work. Um, I think now is common knowledge, but in the first years of the struggle against this after 2016, um, there was a lot of hope. All these fact-checking organizations sprouted everywhere. And we found very quickly that people reject the facts when they don't shoot, suit their political identities. That actually, I'd go deeper, people enjoy rejecting the facts. Facts remind people of their limitation. They remind people of their mortality more than anything else. Death is the biggest fact. 
a leader who is promising a revolt against reality is deeply attractive. So the idea that you could just counter this just with facts didn't really work. And once we got, we'd realized that, we, we sort of started on a long journey of really trying to understand the motivation of these audiences. I very much believe that to fight propaganda, you have to understand people and why they're attracted to the propaganda. And we're in a sort of race with the propagandists as to who can reach people better and engage them better. The propagandists offer, you know, the false community of the conspiratorial crowd who are us bunching together against some sort of mysterious them. So it gives a sense of community. They give a sense of superiority. You know, and Surkov's sort of cynical superiority. You felt cleverer than anybody else. You'd seen through the delusions of democracy and, and truth. They um, legitimize our most uh, um, taboo feelings, um, including feelings of sadism. Um, they generate those feelings very often. They generate humiliation, especially in dictatorships like Russia. And then they become the way through which you can compensate by humiliating others. Now, when we're in a world like that, the idea that you could counter that with a bit of fact-checking doesn't seem very valid. So we started to sort of play around with, you know, we would take, we would try to understand why are people into conspiracy theories, for example. And we found people who were um, suggestible to conspiratorial thinking were often suffering from a deep lack of agency. They felt they had no control over their life. And the conspiratorial propaganda helped explain that and helped almost become a sort of a, a remedy for that, a pseudo remedy, but a remedy for that. Um, and so the answer really wasn't, you know, debating the conspiracy theories or trying to prove a conspiracy theory was wrong, but actually thinking about how do you create media and other forms of communication? How do you create social media that empower people, that give people a sense of agency? And we've looked at things like engagement journalism, where people get the chance to set the agenda um, and to select which stories are covered by journalists. The journalists are helping them and making them feel more powerful. Now, those are all baby steps. Um, but during my sort of journey through thinking about how you fight conspiratorial propaganda, I came across a person that I wanted to tell you about today. Um, well, this happened kind of during COVID, when I'm sure you remember we couldn't travel very much. Much of my work has got to do with traveling around the world. And looking at, you know, the problems with propaganda in the Philippines, and Mexico, and many other places. So I had to turn inwards during COVID, and I started doing more historical reading. And I came across a story of all things, the Second World War, which is not something that I've ever focused on. And I became very intrigued by a British plan, or a British project to undermine Nazi propaganda in the Second World War. And it's a, it's a story that had been told a little bit in the 1960s when the people who led this project uh, wrote their memoirs. But then it faded from view for many reasons. And what happened in the 1990s and 2000s is that all the classified documents that the British had about this operation became declassified. And there was this wonderful archivist that I've been working with called Lee Richards, who had started to gather these very, very disparate documents, all secret British strategy from World War II, from their propaganda department, and, and put together a picture of what happened. And he was incredibly, well, I could have never have done this book, which will, the book will be out next year, without this archivist. And, and I love all archivists, and all archivists are... are are the real, the real fighters against the perversions of postmodernism because they really collect truth and knowledge and, and show that it's that it's um that it's so powerful. So I'm not look, I'm not a historian, I'm not a, uh, an expert on World War II. Um, but I wrote this book anyway, because as I read about this operation and as I read about the man who led it, 
I felt for the first time, I actually felt there was something we could try against this postmodern fascist propaganda spread by Sokol and which emanates across the world. Now, it's worth telling the story of the man who led this operation. His name was Seth Kandelma, and he had a very interesting biography, which I think, um, really, without which you can't understand the rest of his work. So I'm going to start by telling you about him as a person, and then what he did in World War II, and then what we can learn about him. Hopefully, I'll leave some time for questions. So, Seth Tendelman, his childhood is really the most important part of his story. He was born in Germany. His father was an Australian academic teaching at Berlin University. And Seth Tendelman was born in Germany. And he was born in 1904. So, at the age of 10, he is a little British boy at a gymnasium in Berlin at the start of the First World War. And almost overnight, the attitude towards him changed. Before that, he'd been kind of celebrated as this fascinating child in Charlottenburg, this sort of interesting family of academics who all spoke perfect German. His father insisted he spoke German at home, not just at school. So the German would be perfect. Um, this fascinating British family, loved by the neighbors, his father a professor, and you know, you're all aware of the German educational caste system and how important it is to be a professor. Suddenly he's the enemy. Suddenly everybody turns on him and says, Du Ferreta, you know, who are you, you English boy in our midst? All around him, he can see the propaganda building, people sort of pushing away their humanity and embracing this uh, feverish mass identity and mass hatred. Of course, this is a time when, you know, German newspapers and films and other new technologies are uniting uh, Germany into a sort of a a propaganda community in many ways for the first time. And Delma describes this very powerfully, but what is so remarkable in his memoirs of his early childhood is how he, a British boy in a German school who's bullied for being British, finds himself, despite himself, caught up in the German propaganda. And he does these amazing scenes where he describes how he's in school and there's almost like a second hymn that starts to repeat the German songs, the German war song. And he's marching along with the other kids and enjoying it. He comes home and all the city is celebrating victories over the British, victories against his country. And he's about to hang a flag out of his apartment to celebrate as well. And his mother sort of grabs him and pulls him back. And he goes, oh my God, what am I doing? How can I, a little British boy, suddenly be caught up in a propaganda where I am the enemy? And this becomes an almost leitmotif throughout all his work. The honesty to admit how each of us is susceptible to propaganda, that all of us yearn for a remedy from loneliness, how the feelings that propaganda unlocks are so, so powerful that they carry you away. But even in this early childhood in Berlin, he sees that the Germans around him are playing a double game. Yes, they perform, and when they perform it, they, they're genuine in their performance of the propaganda all around them. They repeat the slogans. They're genuinely enthusiastic about the war. 
But then there's another them. They have another personality, which they can switch into. And when he talks about the director of a school who every morning is giving these sort of you know, Führer-like speeches about the evil British and how the whole world has forced Germany into this war, in the morning, on stage in school in the aula, in the afternoon, he meets with um, Seth and his mother and apologizes about the war and how embarrassed he is and how hard it must be for a British family trapped in this ridiculous war. So he begins to realize, hold on, people have different selves. They can be both entranced, or maybe they're acting entranced, and they can be completely rational. And this idea that there's multiple selves remains throughout his work. Now, afterwards, he goes back to Britain in 1917, where very well, uh, where he is, um, after having been a British boy in Berlin, he's accused of being a German boy as soon as he gets back to London. He's bullied for having a German accent because he spoke English with a German accent. He's bullied for speaking Latin in a slightly, in the way it's taught in German schools, not in the way it was taught in English schools. For wearing the wrong socks. He's used to wearing these little short Berlin sailor socks. And in England, people wear socks up to their knees. So, you know, he really starts to understand when he returns to Britain that even his Britishness, which he thought so core to his identity, is also a, a piece of theatre that he will learn to play, but it's not quite him. Now, Seth and Delmer went on to finish school in England. He went to Oxford. And then he went back to Germany, interestingly enough. Despite his traumatic childhood, he goes back to Berlin and becomes, and right here I have to do a pause because I can see my, my computer is about to die. And he goes back to Berlin in the 1930s and he becomes probably the most famous British journalist in, uh, in Germany, um, covering Weimar Berlin, covering all the political changes, always coming back to the cabaret nature of social identity. He's very good in his early journalism at describing, of course, the cabaret is booming in Berlin at the time, and he very much describes the political games in Germany, uh, all the different social roles and artistic roles that are being experimented with as, as a vast sort of cabaret. He speaks fluent German. He probably understands German society much better than any other British journalist. And maybe that is the reason why he spots very early the development and the rise of the Nazis. And already in the 20s, he befriends the Nazi leadership when they're still just a, 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 part, a you know, fairly medium-sized political party. He befriends the leadership, ingratiates himself with them, and basically very early on says, this is going to be the future of Germany. These guys are going to go right to the top. But it's fascinating seeing how he described the Nazis, given how he would then think about ways to subvert their propaganda. Now, he gets very close to them. He hosts parties for them in the evening where Goebbels and Hans Stengel are, are not Goebbels, Goering and Hamstengel are, are frequent guests. Um, they drink all night at his apartment in Berlin. Um, he's not close to Goebbels or Hitler. He's closer to, to, to other people in the movements, very close to Ernst Rohm. And he gets to know them very, very deeply. And it's fascinating how he describes them. He essentially describes them as a form of cabaret. He basically... And he often compares them to a form of cabaret. He basically describes them as a, a grotesque theater act, which is able to express Germans' deepest, darkest desires to legitimize them, to create the sense of community, at the same time to obliterate any idea that facts even matter. But here's the trick that he thinks the Nazis pull off, or rather fall into themselves. They're a cabaret that 
wants everyone to think that they are not an app, that they are a real new identity. He wants people, they want people to identify themselves with Hitler, with being an SS man, with being an Aryan. This is an act that you're meant to, at the end of the day, fall into and become. And when he talks about Hitler's speeches, he describes it very much in this way that, you know, who we both we have a leadership and followers who have got caught up inside an act that they've now started to almost fully inhabit. However, throughout the 1930s and the rise of the Nazis, he's always writing how there is still a crack there. At some level, people know that they're acting. At some level, Hitler is always acting. But also at some level, all the people who follow him are also acting. Yeah? They may have genuine, what seems like genuine enthusiasm, but at some level, they're aware of what they're doing. There's actually a very famous Theodore Adorno essay, which argues something very simple, that below the sort of theater of hypnotization, there's always a conscious act of playing a role. So let's just go back to my original thesis about Sefton Delma and Sukov. At the moment, they sound very similar. You know, both of them are sort of saying, that all life is a masquerade, that all life is theatre. Both of them have this deeply theatrical view of society. But as we move into, I mean, in that sense, both of them are postmodernists. Yeah. Both of them are deeply aware of, of the performativity of um, social roles. But because they're so close, because they're so similar, is why I think Delma is actually where we have to go when we think about how we fight this sort of propaganda. It's only somebody from the same, almost from the same space, uh, that can actually work against this, this, this sort of, the postmodern propaganda. Now, Second World War starts. Um, there's a very dramatic story, which I tell in my book, about Delmer's attempts to join the British propaganda establishment. He's actually not trusted for a long time. Because he was so close to the Nazis, there are many people who think that he was actually sympathetic. He wasn't at all. Um, he was actually writing really good reports to the British embassy and to his editors in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, saying, these guys will lead Europe into World War. You do not understand what these guys are. So his closeness to them actually made him understand very early the seriousness of the threat they posed. But he did spend a lot of late nights with them. And to maybe somebody looking at him from the side, he may have well have seen sympathetic. So um, he wasn't trusted by the British establishment. He thought he'd been too close. But also the fact he'd been brought in born in Berlin, the fact that he was, had still spoke English with a slight German accent until, until the mid-1930s, all made him see, feel very, very suspect. But finally, after many checks, after many changes in the structure of British propaganda, he is welcomed into what is known as the political warfare executive. The political warfare executive is the department set up in the war to manage all British propaganda and media. So the political warfare executive controls all control, oversees the BBC, oversees leaflets, oversees partisan radios. And Delma's place in this world would be to take over all covert propaganda aimed at Germany. And I'm going to talk about three of the projects he created and why I think they're so interesting today. Now, Delma thought that when you were looking at audiences in Germany, who are a little bit like audiences in Russia today, or the 40% of Americans who, are con or who say they believe the previous US elections were rigged, the followers of Trump, and so on, that simply preaching at them about the virtues of democracy and the value of truth was absolutely pointless. 
they're in a space where facts didn't matter anymore. They were in a space where they had submitted themselves to a leader and giving up their personal agency to a leader. They're in a space where truth and facts were irrelevant. All that mattered, mattered was being part of a community, a political identity, and the emotional satisfaction that you gain from it. So the idea that you could tell them the truth and that would work, the idea that you could read them lectures about the beauty of democracy and freedom was absurd. What he said was we need some way to really tap into what these people care about and to sort of cleave them psychologically away from the political identity and the propaganda that they have put on like a, a piece of clothing that is now stuck on them. The first project that he created, it is the most famous one, probably actually the least important one, but it's still very, very iconic. And I was going to play you some extracts because Delma basically, by the end of the war, ran between 12 and 20 covert radio stations. And very, very little audio remains. Um, what we do have is the transcripts of the radio shows that I've been going through over the last two, three, four years. But there are some audio clips, but we weren't sure about who owns the rights to the audio clips, so we weren't sure whether we should play them. I need to sort out whether I am allowed to play them in public because they belong to uh, various archives. I'm, al I'm allowed to use them in my book. We're not sure whether I can use them in, in, in public events. So the first show, though, that he made was um, was a show that, if you're a German listening into it, in the 1930s and 1940s, 1941, he started. It was meant to sound like soldiers talking to one another. Yeah, It wasn't someone lecturing you like the German BBC was, with lectures by Thomas Mann telling Germans how bad they were. This sounded like intercepts, like what we today would think of hats or leaks. And it was soldiers talking to one another led by a very angry, very foul-mouthed, high-ranking Prussian officer, who was simply known as Desha. And you as the listener, and this was on shortwave, were meant to, were meant to experience a sensation where you were like eavesdropping into these conversations. And the things that were said on this radio station were deeply pornographic, full of a lot of swear words, and essentially expressed a, a point of view that there was a whole cadre of German soldiers who were deeply patriotic, who were in many ways, deeply racist and unpleasant, but who hated not all the Nazis, but Himmler, Goebbels, and the kind of Nazi middle cadres. And the shows were full of these incredible detail of Nazi corruption, incredible detail of sex parties, that the Nazis had and incredible detail about the sufferings of normal soldiers. All based on remarkable research that Delmer's team was collecting. The people he worked with were former uh, social democrat politicians from Germany who had access to various continuing forms of research about what was happening in Germany. They were um, lots of German journalists who had fled to Britain, who were using their various contacts to gather details about what was going on in the country. And um, a lot of people from the Berlin cabaret scene who were the ones performing these roles. A lot of them were Jewish, 
So you had kind of Jews playing Nazis on radios in order to subvert the Nazis. Now, on the one hand, the radio was doing something very new, but it would also seem to be doing something very simple. Yeah, it was taking the anger and the emotions and the desire for sadism that the Nazis capitalized on, and it was redirecting it against the Nazis. But here's where it gets interesting. That's a fairly classic and simple maneuver to do. It's what left-wing populists try to do in the West today you know, when they say, let's redirect the anger that Trump puts onto migrants. Let's redirect that anger onto capitalists. You know, the theory of, of sort of left-wing populism. But that's not what Delmar was doing. Delmar was doing something much, much more interesting. You weren't meant to follow the chef as a new leader. The chef was the name of the radio. You weren't meant to identify with him. Yeah. It wasn't just redirecting anger so that you could follow another leader. That's not what he was doing at all. The show almost worked like a piece of cabaret. Or actually, the closest thing it worked to was Brechtian theatre. Delmer's aim, and he talks about this, was to talk, use the language often of Nazi propaganda in a way where it was pushed, in his words, into the ridiculous. Now, this was not satire. This was not a satire show. People were meant to think this was the real thing. This was not exaggeration to the point of absurdity. Delmer was very skeptical about satire. This was something much, much more subtle. This was ever so slightly taking the form and content of Nazi propaganda and doing two things. Ever so slightly exaggerating it so that you started to feel a sense of alienation from it. Yeah. Taking those emotions and in a sense withdrawing you from them. You want to more identify yourself with these characters. You want to gain distance from them. You meant to get a relief from the need for identifying with the leader. Now, if the argument of a Putin or a Hitler or a Trump is that they are the channel through which you can find relief for all your resentment and anger, here was a character who talked about this almost like in a good play, in a drama played out all these feelings, gave a space for their expression, but then almost dragged themselves away from you, leaving a sort of space. Think about the leader, the difference between a cult leader and, and a therapist. Yeah. Um, the therapist is also helping you express all these feelings, but so you can be free of them. While the cult leader wants to understand all your angers and frustrations to manipulate them in order to make them the source of relief. So that was a, the first stage of what Delmer was trying to do. He was working with the same underlying resentments and angers and desire for sadism that the Nazis were and that propagandists do today. And he was almost like a, a surgeon, like creating a little space where you could have a little bit of you outside of those feelings and could start to think critically of the Nazis. Just, um, and just quickly, quickly, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry yeah. to intervene shortly, Peter. Um, I'm, I'm worried about uh, time because the the scheduled time slot is over. Oh, would no, it, it gets, but it's it was getting ever more exciting. So oh, no, would it I maybe it be hour. possible to wrap up in five minutes yeah, yeah, and then yeah, we yeah, meet yeah. for a sequel sometime? Of course, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, but we have a 90 thought, uh, minute block afterwards and have to start in time with that. That's okay. I'm so sorry. Thank I thought you. it was 3.30 to 4.30. I'm so sorry. I, I was actually just watching my clock and I was timing things perfectly. Okay. I'm so sorry. Well then, that's fine. I can get through the other things faster. I was going slowly on purpose. Um, so, so that was the first thing he did. He created an emotional pause between you and the leader. 
And in so doing, he was always making you aware of the theatrical nature of the propaganda you were surrounded. So still, in a sense, working very closely to the space where Sokov is. Sokov is also trying to show that everything is theater. But Sokov's aim, and the aim of the postmodern propaganda, is to say everything is a sham, everything is theater, therefore you can't change anything, therefore you have to have all your experiences through me. Well, Delmer is almost reversing that. He's saying the propagandists around you are theater, but you can start thinking and feeling for yourself. Now, the shows that Delmer made afterwards, and I'll summarize them very briefly, are all ways to make the listener feel that they have agency again. He never lectures on democracy, but everything he does is about motivating you, often for the most simple things, to start thinking for yourself again and start thinking in terms of truth and lies again. Often to do with things like how to defect from the front or how to find ways to financially survive during the bombardments, uh, not financially, financially and, and just survive during the bombardments of German cities. He starts to play into people's self-interest, but in a way that frees them from the Nazis and makes them independent again. Absolutely key to this, and I'll leave it on this thought, is how you were meant to experience this media. Now, the way that Surkov or Trump creates media is whether it's on TV to make you passive and in that passivity to experience, to you know, give over your agency to Putin or to Trump, or on forms of social media where you're not act you think you're engaging personally, but actually just getting caught up in an online mob, an online crowd. Delma was doing something very, very clever. In his later radio show, they pretended to be pseudo-Nazi radio shows that were quietly giving subversive information that undermined the Nazis. But here's where it gets interesting. Everybody who was listening to them knew this was the British dressed up as the Nazis. And the British knew that everybody knew that these were the British dressed up as the Nazis. But, and they wrote this in the strategy, by playing this masquerade, they gave people a psychologically and a physically safe way to listen to them. But it's very important to think about the process somebody is going through when they tune into a radio in this way. They're no longer a passive receiver of information. They're getting involved in an active game. Essentially, what Delmer is saying is that in order to be yourself again, in order to be active again, you have to put on a mask and a role. He's involving you in a theater where you take an active part in creating your own roles. Now, to do that today online is a million times easier than it was on radio. But that, I think, is the essence. When we think about how do we fight the postmodernist propagandists, it won't be with a direct return to the BBC of the 1980s with a voice from on high dictating the truth to you. It's going to be by stimulating active citizens. So the action of democracy, the behavior of democracy psychologically and physically, and which is deeply connected to a sense that you can reinvent the social role that you play around. And you'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening to me, even over time. Nearly in time. Thank you so much, Peter, for this inspiring talk. And I really, really deeply regret that there's no time for questions because sorry. I would have many, and I'm no, sure my, my, uh, others. My mistake, my mistake, sorry. Please. Oh, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was great you joined us, really, and uh, making us think. Um, and it's maybe nice to leave it here. It would, would have been so many questions about, is it memes? Uh, what media would have to be needed? Um, but thank you. Thank you for not only talking about Russia today, but giving the conference this deep historical grounding.
speak soon. Yeah, and we'll see bye. each. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see each other in 10 minutes for the lecture of Nikita Davan on truth.